Assalamu alaikum. This is lesson number eight in our eight to level biology series. And today's lesson is uh, from chapter number 15, Control and Coordination in Plants. Um, so we are going to describe the rapid response of Venus flytrap to stimulation of hairs on the lobes of modified leaves and explain how the closure of the trap is achieved. So let's move on to the PowerPoint then. So in today's lesson, we'll be talking about plant communication. So plants actually communicate both ways. They communicate through chemical communication, uh, where we will be talking about the hormones or the plant regulators. And they also communicate through electrical communication. And see, because they have to actually respond um, to stimuli, which can be both internal and external. So they communicate through different parts, which can be roots, stems, leaves, fruits, or flowers. Um, so they can actually, there can be some external factors like can be gravity or availability of water and light. So plants respond to these changes. And how do they respond to those? So we'll talk about them one by one. So first up, let's talk about electrical communication. And in this particular topic, we will be taking example of Venus flytraps, right? The one that is in our course. So since we are talking about electrical communication, so let's talk about action potentials then. Uh, since plants do not have any neurons or the nerve cells, just like animal cells, but still action potentials do take place. So these action potentials in a plant cell travel along the membranes of the plant cell through the plasmodes meta. So you can see here, so this is a cell membrane and you can see actually that this is how this action potential is traveling, right? So it is traveling here also. And then you can see it is actually, um, it travels along the plasmodes meta and then it is going to the other cell. Right, so this is how action potentials actually travel. Now this action potential in plant cells differs from animals in the sense that it lasts longer in plants, right? And it travels more slowly. While the opposite case was true in case of animal cells as we have just uh, discussed in the previous um, lessons of ours. Now these action potentials are triggered by either chemicals, right? Which can be definitely since plants are exposed to chemicals, it can be triggered by the chemicals or it can be triggered by animal grazing. And the effect is that, that it would, there would be changes in metabolic actions of the plants. So this is how the effect will be seen as. So we will be discussing the example of Venus flytraps and electrical communication. So let's just look at the picture first. So Venus flytraps are actually called carnivorous plants, right? And there's a reason that there's carnivorous plants. It's not like they cannot undergo photosynthesis and make their own food. They can make their own food but they live in such environments where actually the soil is deficient in nitrogen. So to overcome the nitrogen deficiency, they use insects or other small animals as a source of their protein actually, right? So um, generally what happened if you look at the shape, so the, in, the interior here is actually convex shape, right? So leaves are bent inward, which are red in color also to attract the insects, right? But once it's closest, so you can see this part here is concave. Right, so when the trap is open, so if you are looking at this part here, when the trap is open, so you're looking at the red bit here also, the leaf, it bulges upward and it's convex shape, right? But once it closes, right, you see the leaves, it bends inwards and the shape becomes concave. Then you can also see this, there's a midrib in between, right? So this actually midrib has two lobes. So this is one lobe and this is another lobe. And then this is a midrib in between. Right, so interior, as we just discussed, okay, these are red and these are actually to attract the insects. They also have those nectar secretions from the glands along the edge of the lobes, right? Then each lobe, if you look at this one here, focus on this one here, it has three stiff hair, which respond to being deflected. So the action potential that we're talking about actually is generated as these hair are deflected, right? And so there are three on each lobe. So there are three here and there are three on this lobe. Right, the outer edge, if you look at this edge here, the outer edge, this one, this also have a stiff hairs that interlocking and actually when they interlock, it creates a trap for the insect inside. So once this fly, let's say if it goes in and it deflects these stiff hair, right? So this trap would close and these are the hair which are on the outside, they would interlock, right? And then the surface also has many glands which secrete the digestive enzymes. So that we'll uh, talk about later once we see that as the uh, prey gets trapped here, so how those digestive enzymes get secreted here, 
Right, so this is the general view of how this Venus flytrap actually looks like, right? Okay, then. So we were just discussing um, through the picture. So let's just uh, read through here also. So yes, NARS possess communication systems that enable them to coordinate the different parts of their bodies. So they can be leaves, stems, um, the roots, right? So this Venus flytrap, yes, we call it as a carnivorous plant. The reason because its supply of nitrogen compounds by trapping and digesting small animals. So actually it, it gets its supply from there, right? So mainly insects. And uh, if you talk about insects also, so it's generally spiders also, right? So specialized leaf is divided into two lobes on either side of the midrib. So we just saw in this diagram also. So this is a midrib and these are the two lobes there, lobe one and lobe two, right? Then the side of the lobes is red, inside of the lobes is red, we just saw that, and has nectar secreting glands on the edges to attract the insects. Then each lobe has three stiff sensory hair that respond to being touched. If an insect, for example, a fly touches one of these hairs with enough force, action potentials are stimulated, which then travel very fast along the leaf. And then these action potential cause the two lobes to fold together along the midrib, capturing the insect. Right? So this is a general overview. If you want to note the four points. All right then. So how this action potential is generated? So see, this is how it starts. So the insect is attracted to the nectar inside. So we know there is nectar. Insect would be attracted toward that. It would land inside the plant. And once it lands inside the plant, it's bound to deflect the sensory hair on the lobe. Right. So once it touches the sensory hair, like let's say for one time, action potential will be generated, right? Now, and this action potential, if it is deflected for a longer time, right? So it causes the leaf to fold over and trap the insect. What happens because of that? Now, once the sensory hair is deflected actually, it activates the calcium ion channels at the base of the hair to open. So these sensory hair have calcium, calcium ion channels at the base. So these calcium channel, channel, ion channels open, Right? Because of that, calcium ions rush into the plant. And this is actually what depolarizes it, right? So it generates a receptor potential then. Now, this action potential will only travel across if, so there are conditions. If two hair is stimulated between 20 to 35 seconds. So it is not just one hair, right? It can be two hair are deflected within this time span, 20 to 35 seconds or if the same hair is being deflected twice within this time period, 20 to 35 seconds, right? So action potential will be generated even if it touches one time, but if will travel across the trap, if two hair are stimulated within 20 to 35 seconds or the same hair is being deflected twice within this time frame, right? Now, if the second trigger takes too long, Right? For, for example, the insect has come and like um, deflected the deflected one of the hair, right? But if the second trigger takes too long, the trap will not close. It has to be within this time frame, right? And then if it, let's say, doesn't trigger, so the new interval will be initiated. If the hair is then deflected the third time in within that the same interval, now the trap would close, right? So th these are the conditions here. And the time between stimulus and response is 0 0.5 seconds. Right? So stimulus, once it touches the hair and the response is 0.5 seconds, right? And the time for this trap to close is 0.3 seconds, right? So this is how an action potential is generated, right? So I'll repeat one more time. Once this hair gets deflected, right? And if it gets deflected twice or two hair get deflected within this time frame of 20 to 35 seconds, action potential would be generated, right? This would activate the calcium ions, which are actually at the base of the gland to open. Calcium would rush in. This will call depolarization, and it would generate this receptor potential. But action potential will only travel because of these conditions. If two hair is stimulated, or if the hair is stimulated twice, only then it would travel. Right. So see, understand the point that action potential would be generated when the sensory hair is deflected once also, but it would just not continue if these conditions are not fulfilled, right? 
So two hair have to be stimulated between 20 and 35 seconds, or the same hair has to be stimulated twice within the same, same time frame, right? So for the extra potential to continue or to travel to the next cell, these conditions have to be fulfilled, right? So if the second trigger would take too long, so definitely the trap would not close at all. Now let's talk about how this closure takes place. Now for the closure of this, these two lobes to take place, this results from the cell on the top of the lobes to travel to the cells which are underneath it, right? So the water travels down and this causes the elastic tension in the cell walls to release, right? So as the water definitely leaves one of the cells and it moves to the other cells, so the tension, the elastic tension, the cell walls of the of those cells releases, and this is followed by sealing of the trap, right? So this movement of water actually causes the trap to seal. But for these, this trap actually to close, there is one more requirement. The prey has to actually keep on triggering these hairs. And generally this would happen if the prey is trapped, so it would try to escape also. So if it keeps on triggering these hair, this would actually keep this, um, these, these actually, uh, what do you say? These action potential actually would be keep on keeping on generating, right? And this, they will remain constantly activated. Edges of the lows will be then forced together. They will interlock the seed, the trap will be sealed. And finally, once it is sealed, it acts as an external stomach now. Right, so the digestive enzymes are secreted and the prey gets digested. Then, from about a week or ten days later, it is then released and the trap opens one more time. Right, but if the the prey escapes, the trigger would no longer be activated. There will be no action potential and the trap is not sealed. Right, so this is how this closure happens. So for this closure to happen, right, this see this these sensory here have to be triggered continuously. So as we were discussing, the prey would be digested because it would continuously deflect the sensory hair. This would keep those calcium channel ions stimulated. Calcium, channel, chan, calcium ions would keep on flowing into the glands, right? The calcium ions would then stimulate exocytosis of the vesicles with the digestive enzymes. Now, if you can recall um, through the nerve impulses in the synapses, right? Calcium ions were actually involved, right? in the exocytosis of vesicles, but in that case, they were carrying the neurotransmitters. In this case, you're talking about uh, these vesicles are containing digestive enzymes, right? But this is all being stimulated because of the calcium ions, right? Then the trap will remain shut for about a week for digestion. This is how the prey would be digested. So after digestion, the cells on this upper surface of the midrib, they would grow, grow right? Because these cells actually, they would grow and then the leaf would reopen tension would build in the cell walls of the midrib again because this tension was released. It would build again and the trap will be reset, right? So this is what will happen after digestion. So cells on the upper surface would grow, the leaf would re reopen, the tension uh, in, the, um, in the cell walls of the midrib would build on again and then the trap is reset. This is what happens after digestion, right? Okay then, so the thing is that, um, there are two adaptations to prevent energy loss of unnecessary closing. They would not close all the time, right? So what are those adaptations? Now, stimulation of a single hair does not enable closure. Remember, action potential is generated, but if it is not within the same time frame, which is 20 to 35 seconds, it would not be closed, right? So what happens, this prevents the stimulation by non-insects such as dust or rain, right? Because definitely, dust or rain would stimulate that. But if a single hair is being stimulated, it will not be closed, right? Now, there are gra gaps between the stiff hair also. We just saw that in the diagram. So these gaps between the stiff hair create widespread bars of trap. Large insects cannot fit through the gaps, so they cannot escape, right? Trap will seal and digestion occurs. So generally, a small insects actually are lucky also. They can escape, but the larger insects they cannot fit through the gaps, right? There are gaps between those, but large insects could not be able to fit, so they would not be able to escape, right? But small insects that will not provide enough nitrogen to the plant also, they can crawl through the white bars. And here, since they are no longer triggered, right, the trap reopens to catch a bigger insect. 
right? So they would definitely not uh, like uh, like lose their energy in unnecessary closing, right? They would only close when they realize that there's a large insect and they actually will be able to get the nitrogen source out of it. So let's just watch, uh, watch a video related to this whole, um, how this uh, Venus prize traps actually catches the spray. And then we'll move on to the second part of the lesson, which is about the chemical communication. When it comes to deadly predators, plants generally don't come to mind. After all, they're typically at the bottom of the food chain. But the Carolinas are home to one vicious vegetable, the Venus flytrap. Using its famous trap, it can catch prey faster than you can blink. But what happens next inside a Venus flytrap? Funny thing about Venus flytraps, they don't usually trap flies. In fact, winged insects only make up about 5% of their diet. And we really ought to be calling it the Carolina spider trap because that's really, it's only found in the Carolinas and actually a little piece of the Carolinas. And it mostly eats spiders and, and, and ants. But of course, regardless of species, that bug is going to have a bad day. It all starts when the victim wanders into the trap, possibly lured by the bright red hue or fragrant scent. Or maybe they're just unlucky. We think the spiders mostly just blunder. The trap itself looks like an open mouth. It's made of two pads attached to a hinge. On each one of those pads, there are usually three little trigger hairs in a kind of a, a triangle. And those trigger hairs uh, are very, very sensitive to being disturbed. The first time a spider knocks into a hair, it sets off an electrical signal, sort of like the electrical currents in your brain. That signal starts the countdown. If the bug escapes within 20 to 30 seconds, nothing else happens. That way, the plant doesn't waste energy. But if the bug brushes against another hair, snap! In just 100 milliseconds, about four times faster than you can blink, the trap slams shut. Then the trap rapidly goes from convex to concave on each side. And the long little uh, spikes on the rims of the pads interlock to form kind of a cage. Now, of course, the spider isn't happy with this turn of events. So it tries to escape, which is exactly what the plant wants. The more the spider struggles, the more it knocks into the trigger hairs, the tighter the trap closes. And after an hour or two, the trap locks completely. Cells on the edges of the pads secrete moisture, which glues the edges together to form an airtight seal. Suddenly, that trap isn't a mouth anymore. It's a stomach. Digestive juices flood into the closed compartment, dissolving the spider's soft organs. And the trap's lining sucks up that nutrient-rich slushy. After about a week, all that's left is an empty husk, the spider's exoskeleton. Next, the trap reopens and the husk tumbles out. The trap is now ready for its next meal. But bugs aren't the only food the trap captures. Just like leaves on other plants, the trap's surface contains a green pigment that lets it convert the sun's energy into sugar through a process called photosynthesis. So then, why bother with the bugs? Well, Venus flytraps live in acidic, waterlogged soil that doesn't have many nutrients. So instead of slurping up nitrogen and phosphorus through its roots, it needs to borrow some from the bugs. That explains why it shares its home with other hungry carnivorous plants like pitcher plants and sundews, which could only mean one thing. North Carolina is not a fun place to be a bug. So now we'll discuss about the chemical control system in the plant. We've already discussed about the electrical control system as in Venus flytrap. So now we'll talk about the, how these chemicals actually uh, take part. So these are hormone-like chemicals, right? So remember, they're not exactly hormones. They're not secreted by the glands, right? But they are chemicals in plants which are similar to that of animals in being that they are organic substances. Yes, they're also acting in low concentrations 
and they cause changes in other parts of the plant also. But what they're doing is the main effect is actually in terms of plant growth. So they're generally known as growth factors. So these are also known as plant growth regulators, right? So we'll talk about these now. So there are many plant hormones like you are we're seeing here, right? But the ones in our slavers that we'll be talking about are three major types. So auxins that we're going to discuss now, gibberellins, and aphasic acid that we have already discussed. We have already discussed that while we were discussing plant homeostasis and their, their role was there in closure of stomata, right? So in this topic, we are going to discuss about auxins and gibberellins. So these hormones or plant growth regulators they are responsible for communication within the plants and definitely sometimes outside also, right? Now, they are different from animal hormones and how and what way is that they are not produced in a specialized cells within the glands, right? They are produced within a variety of tissues. Now, how actually the movement is regulated because since they are produced, they have to be actually sent somewhere. So they can travel short-term distance, like it's a short distance that they can travel, which is directly from cell to cell. So this transportation uh, is actually done through active transport or by diffusion, right? So they, their movement can be a short distance that needs to be traveled, which is by active transport or diffusion, or it can be long distance transport, which is generally done through phylum in the form of a cell, right? So this is how these regulators, these plant regulators are moved around the plant. So the three major types of plant growth regulators that are in our course are auxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. Abscisic acid we have already discussed in chapter number 14 um, in detail while we were talking about homeostasis in plants. And we have discussed about its role in stomatal closure. So that's how it responds to environmental stress as well as dormancy control. So for this, you can go back to the lesson and. Um, have a look at how it works. In this lesson today, we'll be talking about auxins and gibberellins. So auxin uh, role is in elongation growth and it determines the length of the roots and the stem. So it's very obvious since its role is in elongation growth. Then uh, the apical bud contains meristematic tissue that produces auxins. So let me show you a picture of that first. So this is the meristematic tissue. This is the apical bud. This part is known as apex. Uh, so it can be apex of the shoot or the root. So this is the part that in the meristematic tissue where auxin is produced, right? It is produced and then it travels down. So this is how, uh, this is the site of production of auxin. And then it, it, it goes to different parts where it is needed. So there are special auxin transport proteins in the cell membranes because it is formed there uh, at the apical bud and then it travels uh, along the cell membrane. And then this is how it can be transported from cell to cell, either by active transport or by diffusion, or it can then travel through film also. While when we talk about gibberellins, their role is important in seed germination as well as they control the stem elongation. So we'll talk about them one by one. Okay, so auxin has many different types, but the principal auxin is indole acetic acid, indole three acetic acid. Now you're not required to remember this name, Right, but it's good that you remember, but uh, you can simply refer to it as auxin, right? So it is synthesized in the growing tips of roots and shoots, as we just saw in the picture a while back, those are known as meristems, right? So these are the parts where cell division occurs. So if cell division occurs, number of cells are increasing, right? But then once they're formed there, they have to be transported down the shoot or up the root. So this process is done via active transport. Right, and then, as I said earlier, some of it is transported by the film also. Right now, they are formed there, so it's actually the the growth of the plant, the primary growth of the plant. When we talk about it, actually takes place at the meristems. So that's that's the reason it's the principal site of oxygen production. It is required in uh, cell division. It is required in elongation growth. So that's that's why that's the reason it's present. So there are three types of growth. We just talked about yes, cell division would take place, cell elongation. Um, like we'll talk about that in detail, the, how the cell elongation takes place uh, because uh, it also involves absorption of water. It is controlled by auxin as well as cell differentiation. Okay, so what does auxin actually do? 
what it does is it stimulates the cells to put on hydrogen ions the hydrogen ions which are actually found inside the cytoplasm so it stimulates the cell to pump these into the cell wall now remember the cell wall is made up of cellulose microfibrils right so the hydrogen is not leaving the cell remember it is still inside the cell but it is simply going into the cell wall it is going from the cytoplasm through the cell membrane which is where there is a proton pump and then it goes into the cell wall where uh, as hydrogen ions proton leave there it actually makes this environment acidic right and acidification actually causes these bonds um, uh, along these cellulose uh, membranes microfibrils the hydrogen bonds that actually get weakened they do not break remember that the bonds are not broken it simply become loose right and <clears throat> after that uh, all, uh, like other series of events happen and then finally water would be absorbed through osmosis right and then pressure potential causes the cell wall to stretch and stretching actually makes the cell longer or makes it elongated so we'll talk about the detail of events in a while but this is basically what it does it <clears throat> makes this hydrogen inside the cytoplasm leave the cytoplasm through the proton pumps here on the cell membrane to the cell wall okay so this is another uh, enlarged diagram just have a look this is how it leaves the you can see here right so the red part that you're looking at is auxin it binds to its cell surface receptors causes the hydrogen inside the cytoplasm to go and leave through the proton pumps all right then so let's talk about all the events in detail so these membrane proteins are activated by the binding of auxin so auxin you know can travel across the cell right and so the cell surface membrane or the plasma membrane is activated by the binding of auxin so auxin binds to a specific receptor on the cell surface membrane right and uh, an atp is proton pump actually through through it it actually ends in and then atp is proton pump is activated now because of that hydrogen ions are pumped by atpase protein proton pump out of the cell into the cell wall so what happens oxygen comes binds to a specific receptor on the cell surface membrane because of that the atpase proton pump is activated right now the hydrogen ions which are inside the cytoplasm will be pumped by this atpase proton pump out of the cell remember they will go out of the cell out of the cytoplasm into the cell wall they are not leaving the cell right because of this proton in the cell wall now the ph of the cell wall is lowered right bonds will actually become loose right they will not break as such they would loosen up right and <clears throat> then increase of proton ions in the cell wall activate the cell wall proteins called expansins so this is what happens because of acidity there there are some cell wall proteins which are known as expansins they will be activated now they will lose losing the linkages between the cellulose microfibrils by disrupting the non covalent interactions between the cellulose microfibrils and surrounding substances like hemicellulose right so what is happening because now the hydrogen ions are more in the cell wall it has become acidic this will activate a cell wall protein which is known as expansin expansin will loosen the link between the cellulose microfibrils it will disrupt the non covalent interactions <clears throat> between the cellulose microfibrils and the hemicellulose now this brief disruption this brief disruption allows the microfibrils to move past each other right cells can expand and elongate without the cell wall losing its strength right now after all this what is happening protein uh, the sorry the hydrogen the proton ions have gone out right but what happens next to it potassium ion channels are stimulated to open that right? because the internal environment has become negative now as the proton the positive charged hydrogen ions have moved out the inside of the cell has become negative so this causes the potassium ion channels to open right right the increase of potassium ions into the cytoplasm of the cell will take place right so because of that what happens as the potassium ions are moving inside the cytoplasm this would decrease the water potential of the cell because now we have more potassium inside 
So influx of potassium ions into the cytoplasm causes water potential inside the cell to decrease. This is how the water potential, which is higher outside now, causes the water to move into the cell via osmosis. This is what will lead to elongation of the cell. So let's have a view at the diagram. So what happens? Oxygen comes, binds to the specific receptor. It stimulates the ATPS proton pump through which hydrogen ions from the cytoplasm are sent out into the cell wall, right? Now, since the like positive ions are less here, this will cause the activation of the potassium ion channels also. So they would open and potassium would diffuse in through these channels, right? <clears throat> because of potassium coming in, water potential inside the cytoplasm becomes negative, right? It decreases. And then water from outside, because high, there's higher water potential here, it moves in through osmosis, through aquaporin or through the water channel. This causes the cell to elongate, right? Now the hydrogen, as it goes into the cell wall, it acidifies it. It loses the bond between these microfibrils, right? And it activates another protein, which is known as expensive, right? So this will disrupt the bonding and then eventually these series of events will take place, finally leading to the elongation of the cell. So this is another view, a cell which is which was initially of this size, right? Because of oxygen's action, see what happens? It stimulates this ATPS proton pump, which releases hydrogen ions into the cell wall. Then it activates expansions, which cause loosening of these bonds, right? And the cell can elongate. Right, and look at how the cell has grown up because water has gone in now, it has gone inside the vacuum, right? And then finally, it is leading to the cell elongation. Plants grow when their cells expand. Because a rigid cell wall encloses a plant cell, the cell wall ultimately controls the rate and direction of growth. When a seedling grows toward light, for instance, the cell walls on the dark side of the seedling loosen, allowing these cells to expand. In this way, the plant bends toward the light. The expansion of a plant cell is driven primarily by the uptake of water, which enters the cytoplasm of the cell and accumulates in its central vacuole. As the vacuole expands, it presses the cytoplasm against the cell wall. However, the cell wall is tough and resists this force. This is the basis of Turger pressure. The cell wall is an extensively cross-linked network of polysaccharides and proteins dominated by cellulose microfibrils. If the cell is to expand, cellulose and other polysaccharides must loosen their grip on each other, allowing the wall to give under Turger pressure. Once the cell wall is stretched, new cellulose microfibrils will be laid down to maintain the strength of the wall. The plant hormone auxin plays an important role in the expansion of the cell wall. When a plant grows in the direction of light, for instance, it does so because auxin made at the tip of the plant is transported to the cells on the dark side of the plant. Auxin triggers the cells on the dark side to elongate. Scientists wanted to know how auxin loosens the cell wall. Studies in the 1970s showed that acidifying the medium in which shoot segments were growing, that is adding hydrogen ions, also called protons, caused the segments to grow just as rapidly as shoots treated with auxin. Additionally, treating shoot segments with auxin increased the hydrogen ion concentration in the growth medium. These results suggested that auxin might loosen the cell wall by causing the release of hydrogen ions from cells thereby decreasing the pH in the cell walls. Consider an experiment in which you add auxin to shoots. Half of the shoots tested are also incubated in a buffer that prevents the cell walls from becoming acidic. What do you think will happen to each set of shoots? When a buffer is used to prevent the wall from becoming acidic, auxin-induced cell expansion is blocked. The buffer-treated shoots do not elongate. 
How might this so-called acid growth process occur in nature? Auxin has two roles in this process. In one, auxin enters cells and acts with a protein in the cell to stabilize a proton pump. The pump is then inserted into the plasma membrane. The proton pump uses ATP as an energy source to pump protons from the cell into the cell wall. The pH of the cell wall is thus reduced or acidified. Auxin also enters the nucleus and by a multi-step process turns on the expression of genes. One such gene codes for the proton pump that is so important in acidifying the cell wall. Auxin therefore both increases the synthesis of the proton pumps and helps guide their insertion into the plasma membrane. How does acidifying the cell wall actually loosen it up? It turns out that the lower pH activates enzymes called expansins in the cell wall. Expansins disrupt interactions between cell wall polymers. With a high trigger pressure inside the cell, the cell can now expand because the cellulose microfibrils are no longer tightly tethered to each other. In the acid growth hypothesis, auxin causes acidity in the cell wall that activates expansins. Now, another very important role of auxin is in apical dominance, right? You also get a six mark question for that. So auxin transport proteins and uh, how do auxin actually, how does it move down the shoot from the apical bud? Uh, initially, we said it's actually formed here at the apex, right, of the shoot or the roots, and then it moves down, right? So to wherever it is needed. So how actually does it happen? So what happens? Once it forms here at the apex, it moves down and this leads to accumulation of auxin in the lateral bud. So this part here, right? So you can see this part here, it actually accumulates here. So it forms at the apex, it moves down and it settles here. It accumulates here at the lateral buds. What happens because of that, it inhibits the growth of these lateral buds. They would not grow, but only the growth will happen towards through the apex only. The growth will happen only in the upward direction, right? So once it accumulates there in the lateral buds here, their growth will be inhibited, right? And then this will lead to apical dominance. If there is any actively growing apical bud at the top of the shoot, shoot will only continue to grow upwards and no branches will develop laterally. So this is what auxin does. It promotes apical dominance, right? Now, so this was proven by cutting off the apical bud. So if you cut this bud off, so here they have shown you here, if we cut this off, so auxin would not be able to accumulate in the lateral buds. If it has not been accumulated, lateral bud growth would not be inhibited anymore and the plants can grow the lateral branches, right? So this is done uh, during pruning also. See, and it makes the plants bushier. So if you want to make those hedges, right? <clears throat> so this is done, this, uh, this apical bud is cut off and then with this promotes this lateral bud movement. So you can see here also, you can see here also, right? So you can see in the same diagram here also. So this is the active apical bud that is inhibiting this lateral growth, right? And once it is cut off, so this uh, lateral growth bud would actually, will stop growing, will start growing actually, sorry. It will start growing. So it will make the plant more bushier. So you have these growth here, you have these growth here, these growth here. So you can have a look at this picture also. So these are the axillary bud that would remain dormant till the time um, the apical bud is intact. But once it's cut, the stump is removed. So lateral branches would start to grow. So you can see here, right? the growth has started. Let's talk about plant's hormone. The structure of plant is divided into two components, the apical shoot and the lateral bud. Auxin is the top plant's hormone that is secreted at the tip of apical shoot. The presence of auxin will promote growth and elongation of apical shoot. At the same time, it suppresses the growth of lateral bud. 
This concept of auxin promoting growth and elongation of apical shoot by suppressing the growth of lateral bud is known as apical dominant. Study shows that by removing the apical shoot, the lateral bud will grow longer. The principle behind is related to another type of plant's hormone called cytokinin. Cytokinin is synthesized in the root. At the same time, the leaf is conducting photosynthesis by producing organic compounds such as sugar. When auxin is present in the apical shoot, auxin will attract accumulation of organic compounds and cytokinin hormone in the apical shoot. This promotes the growth and elongation of apical shoot. However, when the apical shoot is removed, this removes the effect of auxin. In the absence of auxin, the organic compound and cytokinin are free to be distributed to the lateral bud. Thus, it promotes the elongation of lateral bud. So let's talk about the last of the plant regulators, which is gibberellin. So gibberellin is synthesized in most parts of the plant such as leaves, seeds, and stems. And we are going to talk about its role in stem elongation as well as in seed germination. So these are the two important roles that we will be discussing here for gibberellin. So the highest concentration is found in young leaves and seeds, right? And the active form of gibberellin is referred to as gibberellinic acid, or we simply call it GA, capital G, capital A, right? And the main function is, as we are saying, is stem elongation. So its main purpose is to make a plant grow tall as it stimulates the cell division in the stem as well as cell elongation in the stem, right? And once we discuss about its role in stem elongation, we'll talk about how it plays a role in seed germination, such as plants, wheat, and barley. And it also regulates the genes which are involved in the synthesis of amylase. And amylase is actually the enzyme that breaks down starch. So we'll talk about all of these roles of gibberellin. Now, so coming to its role in stem elongation. So uh, in terms of genetics of plant height, gibberellin play a large effect. And this height of a plant is controlled by genes. So for the tall gene, it's capital L, capital E. That's the dominant allele. And for the short gene, it's the recessive allele is a small l, small e. Right, so that's the dominant allele, capital L, capital E, and for the short one, and the recessive is for the short gene. So tall plants can be homozygous dominant, so it can be both capital E, capital L, and capital E, and it can be heterozygous. Right, so tall plant, so their appearance would be as a tall plant, but short plant has to be. All right, and the short plant will have homozygous recessive alleles, so. For a shorter plant or a dwarf plant, we need to have this homozygous recessive alleles, right? So for these dwarf plants, if active gibberellin is added to the dwarf plants, which have these recessive alleles, it can stimulate the growth also. Okay, the thing with these dominant alleles is that they regulate synthesis of the last enzyme in the pathway that produces the active form of gibberellin. Right, so you're not supposed to um, remember the, the name of this enzyme, but this dominant allele, it regulates the synthesis of this particular enzyme, which is in the pathway that produces the active form of gibberellin or gibberellic acid, right? So this active form is formed because of the synthesis of this last enzyme. Uh, what happens here, the recessive allele actually was created due to mutation <clears throat> in the dominant allele. So this was the dominant allele, right, and a mutation took place, and then the recessive allele was created. How was it created? It was created because of substitution mutation, right, because, you know, the enzymes are protein, and what happened is that alanine in the polypeptide chain was replaced by threonine, and it happened near the active site of the enzyme, right, so alanine in the polypeptide chain was replaced by threonine near the active site, what happened because of that, the amino acid change, there was a change in the active site shape of the enzyme that makes the gibberellic acid. Now, because the active site shape has changed, the enzyme is no longer functional, right? And if the enzyme is no longer functional, it will not carry out the event 
in, in which case the gibberellic acid will become active, right? So no gibberellic acid will be produced. So these are the whole turn of events. So active gibberellin is a hormone that helps the plant grow by stimulating cell division and elongation in the stem. The recessive allele <coughs> results in the, in the formation of a non-functional enzyme. And how this happens? It happens because only one nucleotide is different to the dominant allele. So threonine actually replaces alanine, right? So there's a single amino acid substitution. And this happens in the primary structure of the enzyme. This change in the primary structure occurs at the active site of the enzyme and it makes it non-functional. Now, without this enzyme, no active gibberellin is formed and the plants are unable to grow tall. And plants that are homozygous for the recessive allele, a small l, a small e, they are dogs, right? So this can be overcome by like as some farmers, they apply active gibberellin to shorter plants and they stimulate growth in this way, right? So this is the whole sequence of events. So here you, you can see this is a dog of mutant plant and once gibberellic acid is sprayed on it, so look at how the stem elongation takes place, right? So this is the role of gibberellic acid on stem elongation. Okay, now coming to the last part. So gibberellic acid's role in seed germination. So let's talk about the structure of the seed first. So the seed consists of a seed coat. So this outer part that you see here, which is also known as the tester. So it's a tough waterproof protective layer which covers the seed. Then the seed contains embryo that you see here also. So embryo actually will eventually grow into a new plant as the seed germinates. And then we have this endosperm. So endosperm is the part which surrounds the embryo and it contains a starch. And the outer edge of this endosperm is what is called as Eluron layer, right? And this eluron layer is actually the protein rich layer. So you can see another version of it here. So this is embryo. The outer part that you see here is the tester. And then this is the endosperm. The outer layer of the embryo uh, of the endosperm is those this eluron layer. Right? Okay then. So the seed, whenever it is shed from the plant, from the parent plant, it remains inactive. So it is dormant in that stage until it meets the conditions for which germinate, which are actually sufficient for germination to take place, right? So this dormant seed would contain very little water and metabolically it is inactive. <clears throat> so the benefits of this dormancy is that this allows seed survival in adverse reactions, uh, conditions such as cold. It also allows the seed to germinate in warm temperatures, right? So these are the benefits of seed dormancy. Okay. So these are the turn of events that happens. So the seed absorbs water at the beginning of germination. So this is how this starts. Once this water is absorbed, this stimulates the embryo to produce gibberellins. So gibberellins are actually found here in the embryo, right? So they're, they're here in the embryo. Once the seed absorbs water, the seed coat would shed off and then this gibberellin would be produced. Gibberellin, which then actually come out of the embryo and then it diffuses into the eluron layer, which is this layer of the endosperm. So this is the endosperm and this layer of the endosperm, the endosperm, the one that you see here, gibberellin would go and diffuse into that eluron layer. Now this causes or stimulates the eluron cells, this, this layer to synthesize amylase. So this enzyme will be synthesized here in the eluron layer, right? Amylase, mobilizes energy reserves by hydrolyzing starch molecules in the endosperm. Now in the endosperm, there are starch molecules which cannot be metabolized unless there is a amylase enzyme. So what happens when the seed absorbs water, gibberellin gets activated, it releases from the embryo, goes into the endosperm and then diffuses into the aluronic layer. The aluronic layer then stimulates, gets stimulated and synthesizes amylase. Amylase then comes back into the endosperm and then it actually mobilizes the reserves and it hydrolyzes the starch molecules in the endosperm. The starch is then converted into maltose and the maltose converts into glucose. The glucose can then go into the embryo where it can be used for cellular respiration and it becomes a source of carbohydrate for the embryo. And then this actually provides energy to the 
growing embryo. Right, so these, these are the whole turn of events. Okay, so I'm repeating one more time. The seed absorbs water at the same time of germination, right? It produces gibberellins. Gibberellins go into the endosperm, then diffuse with this aluronic layer and it's stimulated to release uh, amylase. Amylase comes back into the endosperm, then hydrolyzes the starch. A starch gets converted into maltose. Then maltose gets converted into glucose and glucose then goes back into the embryo where it is used for cellular respiration. Now, um, now how this actually this amylase, how this amylase is synthesized? Now it happens because um, gibberellin increases the transcription of mRNA that codes for amylase enzyme. So initially, what happens in the aluronic layer, there are DELA proteins, right, already present. DELA proteins' main function is to inhibit the factors that promote transcription. So in this aluronic layer, there will be DELA protein already attached, right? And the main function is to inhibit the factors that promote transcription, right? So amylase enzyme is not produced in the, when the seed is in the dormant form, because in that case, DELA proteins are actually working to inhibit the factors, right? So what does this gibberellin do basically? Gibberellin actually first goes and destroys these DELA proteins. Once the DELA proteins are destroyed, they are no longer inhibiting the factors which promote this transcription. Now, because of that, the mRNA transcription will increase and then amylase enzyme will be produced, which can do, then go inside and hydrolyze the starch to maltose and maltose can be hydrolyzed to glucose and then glucose can be used for aerobic respiration. So this is actually how amylase enzyme is synthesized there in the seed. Right, so here you can see uh, the picture from your book. See, so this is the seed. So you can see the embryo, right? When it absorbs water, gibberellin will be released. It goes into the aileron layer. So aileron layer, actually first there are DELA proteins there, which are inhibiting the transcription of mRNA for amylase, right? But gibberellin goes and destroys the DELA, right? And then it causes the synthesis of amylase amylase come back into the endosperm, causes conversion of starch to maltose, and then maltose into glucose, which then go back into the embryo and take part in aerobic cellular respiration, right? So this is the gibberellin's response or action in seed germination. So here you can look at another diagram. And then, so lastly, this is how it happens. It's just a flow chart for you to remember. So it happens with the imbibition of water. Gibberellic acid diffuses to a neuron layer. It binds to the specific receptor in the layer. Transcription of genes for the protein synthesis is activated. Production of hydrolytic enzymes, right, which are amylase. They are secreted into the food reserve in the endosperm. Starches are converted to soluble sugars. Then digested soluble food substances are translocated to the embryo and then which is then used for respiration or growth of the young root and shoot. Okay then, so we are done with this chapter. And I'll see you with the next chapter then.